Welcome everyone and thank you to, for joining our Global Poverty 2020 webinar. I'm Amelia Kuklovitz, Regional Manager for Asia and Latin America. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Akramean Foundation and I'm based in Quito, Ecuador. I manage a number of our women's economic empowerment projects and teams who are executing Grameen's great work. Thanks for joining us today. We're hosting this event to commemorate the United Nations International Day for the Eradication of Poverty on October 17th. The 2020 theme is acting together to achieve social and environmental justice for all. Since it was declared an annual day of commemoration in 1987, it has been a day to acknowledge the struggle of people living in poverty and an opportunity to make their voices heard. According to the UN, the day also reflects the willingness of people living in poverty to use their expertise to contribute to the eradication of poverty. Those who know Grameen Foundation know how this tenant aligns so closely with our mission and our conviction that the poor can create a world without poverty when we equip them with the tools that they need to succeed. How we will achieve that and how Grameen is responding to the extraordinary situation thrust upon all of us in 2020 is what we'll be sharing with you all today. As you'll see our agenda today, we're going to start um, talking about what international development looks like today. We'll be sharing our Grameen's model to eradicate poverty. We'll have a conversation with a community agent from Ghana. We'll meet Mitra Vandana, who will also tell, talk about her experience as a community agent. We'll have some time to talk about the Grameen model, some questions and answers from all of you. And then we'd like to let you know about our latest development, our COVID-19 unconditional cash transfer pilot results. And then we'll have also another opportunity for you to ask us questions about our COVID-19 response. And then Steve will close us up. So thanks so much for joining and giving all this information. Let's get right away started. So I'm pleased to um, introduce Steve Hollingworth, our president and CEO of Grameen Foundation. Uh, Amelia, thanks so much uh, and welcome all. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to Amelia. She's really one of our leading lights. She spearheads so many of our vital initiatives and she's such an unflinching professional. She brings so much passion to the work. Uh, she's also just a lot of fun to work with. So Amelia, thank you for hosting us today. Uh, I'd like to thank our wider team too for pulling this together. Uh, it's a big effort across a lot of geographies and we're, we're very pleased that we can welcome everybody and again thank you for joining. You know we, we are commemorating the United Nations International Day for Eradication of Poverty and the title of our webinar is Keeping Hope Alive and certainly in 2020 that is a tall order for all of us but we know uh, that we all gain you know hope insights to hope from each other from the spirit and energy of each other and certainly from the people that we, that we serve uh, all over the world. Uh, you know, in this global health crisis, you know, we're, we're actually not just facing one crisis, a health crisis, we're actually facing three crises that are impacting the global poor. Health, the economic lives of the poor are being fundamentally impacted, uh, access to income and employment, and the food security of the poor are also being impacted. So we talk about three interconnected crises that are impacting the, the poorest people on earth at the moment. And the, the unfortunate thing is, is that these crises are setting back actually by decades, the progress that we've made towards eradicating poverty. Before COVID, there had never been a period in human history when as many people were elevated out of abject poverty as there had been over the past 30 years. And this, frankly, at the moment is reversing. This trend is reversing. You may have seen a staggering report coming out of the World Bank that estimates an additional 115 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty due to these crises. There's a broader set of issues that are being also impacting the poor. In, in particular, the pandemic is increasing homelessness. It's, it's increasing the ability of the poor to access clean, uh, water and sanitation services, healthcare, and it's it's surging in hunger. And estimates are that this uh, that these impacts will impact another 240 to nearly half a billion people, uh, according to the the UN studies. 
in my 30 years plus in working in, in international development, I can honestly say that there's never been a time when the work of our of organizations like the Grameen Foundation has become so urgently required. And I believe this is particularly true for our work at Grameen Foundation because of the work we do in, employ, in employing new tools uh, for serving the poor that rely on mobile phones and the digital revolution. This is becoming increasingly needy and used by the poor to continue their links uh, to the outside world. Not only, not only am I concerned about those issues, I'm also concerned about the, the fact that, that as an international community, we run the risk of retreating from efforts that have, have been in place for a very long time to continue the progress. And this is not the time to pull back. Doubling down now is even more important than ever, given the trends that were faced. But I take, I take hope from the amazing work of my colleagues at Grameen Foundation. I'm inspired, we're all inspired by the resilience and fortitude of the people we support. Grameen Foundation reaches 13 million people with life-changing help in the areas of access to financial services, agricultural production and marketing, health information and encouraging healthy behaviors. We have a goal of reaching 25 million by 2025 and we're on track for that. When I say we use uh, new tools uh, of the digital revolution, it's largely the mobile phone. And the mobile phone has become an even greater lifeline during this pandemic. At Grameen Foundation, we're able to link the poor to trusted individuals, the Grameen community agents, who are largely women uh, in, in their own communities. And these community agents are a link to help the poor continue to access loans, savings, and other vital financial services. The phone, the agent, the Grameen community agent, and data are key to helping increase access to information. It helps continue to produce food, run small enterprises vital at this time, and continue to link very remote communities to the outside world. And having a trusted member as a bridge to these tools is, in our view, the ingredient of our success, the Grameen community agents. We are extremely proud that over, over the last years, we've trained and supported in excess of 300,000 agents across the countries we work in, and you'll hear from a few. And like us, the poor are depending on, on digital and virtual links to keep them going. In India, our agents have seen a 200% increase in the demand for their services. Our agents are providing health messages to help communities undertake the right steps to mitigate the spread of the virus. Our platforms are linking farmers to information on, on where to sell and how to best produce their crops. We're providing access to information, training, and finance that are keeping vital small businesses going in remote areas. And our platforms also help vaccine scientists gather information about trials that they're conducting. Grameen community agents are essential workers who carry out vital services to help the poor overcome these three crises. And we want to highlight this, this work to you today, in particular with one uh, of our key activities in response to the COVID emergency. We've, we've been executing the COVID-19 emergency cash pilot program. And this has been very, very successful and critical at this time. And we're in the process now of finding ways to continue to scale it. As most of you are aware, and you'll see from the video that's coming up, you know, Grameen is not traditionally an emergency aid uh, agency. And our mission is really about empowering the poor, especially women, to create a world without poverty and hunger. And this, in our view, is about providing long-term solutions that help families thrive and survive. But when COVID-19 descended, we realized we had, we had to do things differently. We had to change course. And with the help of our partners and supporters like you, we've had thousands of families survive the impacts of loss of income and employment and to cope with the changing uh, needs for their health behavior. Uh, the numbers I shared earlier are, are very frightening and very overwhelming and very disappointing personally uh, for someone who's worked in this area for so long to see the trends change. 100 million additional poor persons how can, how can we hope to help all of those who desperately need us? And where, where do we find our own hope? Well, as I mentioned, we find it in each other. For those of us at Grameen, we find it in you, our supporters, who continue to stick with us and understand how vitally important our work is. We find hope, I find hope in our staff and our partners in the field and the, and the deep devotion that they bring to the work. 
and we all find hope in the persistence of the people we serve. They continue to overcome tremendous obstacles that make their families' lives better, and they continue to strive to move forward no matter the circumstances that they confront. So thank you very much for being with us today and for your willingness to do all you can do to help uh, during this very, very challenging time in our world. Uh, I wanna pass it back to you, Amelia, and thank you very much. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for those kind and inspirational words. We really appreciate it. So as mentioned, um, we are very excited to share a new video about our Grameen Community Agent model. Um, I'll share a little bit of background. Since Grameen Foundation set its 2016 unifying goal to, to reach 25 million people by 2025, our donors and partners have helped us reach nearly 13 million. So we're we're on the way where the path is looking good. Um, we could see that the efforts were working. So in 2019, we set a course to leverage what we have learned to impact even more people in need. We synthesized all of our research, experience, data, outcomes to narrow down in on our most successful in initiatives and to create a model that create and scale. This may sound complex, but when it comes to what came out of it is the Grameen com Community Agent a simple and impactful strategy for eradicating poverty around the globe. Let's watch the video. By 2021, 150 million people could be living below the extreme poverty threshold of less than $1.90 a day due to the economic downturn caused by the coronavirus. When we measure those who lack basic shelter or clean water, and children who go hungry, the ranks of the poor will swell by 240 to 490 million this year. Since 1997, Grameen Foundation has worked to empower the poor, especially women, to create a world without poverty and hunger, because we know people living in poverty have the strength and ingenuity they need to build better lives, but what they lack is opportunity, and they have never needed it or us more. Experience tells us the best way to deliver opportunity is with a technology plus people approach. We start by designing human-centered digital solutions to connect the poor with resources and information. Then, we train local Grameen community agents to bring those solutions to women and families, regardless of whether they have internet, smartphones, or the ability to read. It's a model that works to help the poor build assets, survive crises, and increase resilience. It's a model that works because as powerful as tools like digital technology and mobile phones are in our fight to end poverty, none are more potent than the human-to-human -human interaction of neighbor helping neighbor. When we recruit, train, and equip a local agent, she becomes a micro-entrepreneur herself, ready to offer her neighbors solutions aimed at eradicating two systemic causes of poverty, lack of financial empowerment and poor crop productivity. When an agent brings financial inclusion to her clients, she delivers more than relief from long and costly trips to a distant bank. She delivers the ability to collect, send, save, and borrow money. When an agent works with smallholder farmers on data-driven farm plans, she delivers more than best practices to improve crop yields. She delivers a business plan that helps ensure lasting success. In every case, the Grameen agent empowers her client with agency to make decisions and opportunity to unleash her own capacity. The result is a chain reaction of measurable outcomes, including increased income, food security, educational opportunities, and sustainability. On average, a Grameen community agent directly impacts 150 beneficiaries, each typically living in a five-member household. This means each agent indirectly impacts about 750 people. And like ripples on a pond, the economic impacts of each agent's influence benefit entire communities. Underlying our model is a deep understanding that agents and the poor women they serve do not live in a vacuum. That's why we work to strengthen women's ecosystems with programs that promote gender equity, peer support, market engagement, health, and nutrition. Since 2016, we've reached nearly 13 million people, and we will keep reaching because our goal is to support as fully as possible every woman who has the courage to break free from poverty, to show her that Grameen Foundation, its partners and donors believe in her. Will you believe too?
Great, now that we've learned more about the community agent model, let's hear from an agent. Next slide, please. In this photograph, you'll see Benedicta in the pink top. Benedicta is a community agent and agronomist serving cacao farmers like Joyce here in the Brong Afo region in Ghana. We um, have a pre-recorded video of Benedicta as well as Francis Arthur, our senior program specialist in Ghana, um, that we'll, uh, we'll see in a moment. Together, they'll help us understand better what is Benedicta's work as a community agent. So we're due to some technical issues that we just had, we're gonna um, have a video to hear from them. Let's play that. So thank you, Amelia. Um, and, and I welcome all participants present. Um, Francis Atta, who have been with Grameen for the past three years and still counting. Um, um, I'm a senior program specialist and my, my work uh, highly pleases me in the field where I engage most rural and remote communities and participants within our project. So um, in Ghana, Grameen's work within the um, digital um, agriculture um, space and also um, agent networks we've been able to equip over 40 um, local community field agents with our digital grid tool called the Farm Development Plan. And um, Benedicta, who I'll introduce um, today, earlier um, in, in, in the session, is one of those um, 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 field agents. So, Benedicta, um, you are welcome. I would like you to tell most of our participants here to understand more about your work with Grameen and also the impact you've had on, on your farmers you, that you work with. So um, first and foremost, tell us about yourself and, and your family. Thank you, Francis, for this opportunity. Um, I'm Benedicto Sewusu from Sunyane. Uh, I'm 30 years of age. I work with Tuton as an FDP officer. Um, I grew up with my parents and my father uh, passed away at a tender age. Uh, I like watching movies and listening to music. I got married about three months ago. Okay, so that's very quick. Um, what was your profession before becoming a Grameen community agent? Well, um, I was uh, an intern as a mapper in Tuton. Uh, I officially became permanent with Grameen FDP through Tuton. And also, uh, as a field agent, I have a lot of project, projects, and amongst them is FDP Grammy project. And also, uh, I would like to say. Um, yeah, so, um, Emilia and Priscilla, can you pause there? I just want to chip in something. Okay. Yeah, so what is um, a typical day at work for you, and how many um, um, clients or farmers do you, do you work with? My, uh, my typical day of work starts, begins at 5 a.m. to visit my various uh, community where I've planned to work for the day. And uh, as a Grameen agent, I work closely with about 188 smallholders cocoa farmers. And aside my, my FDP projects, I also work closely about 288 farmers among the community that I work. So with this engagement that you work with many farmers, can you tell us some impact story or what impact have you really, uh, impact story that can you share with most of the, the, the food agents. So we want just as a one an example of a farmer that you really impacted on his or her life. Okay. Um, there's this woman whose name is Susanna, okay? She has a hectare of land. And for the, for the past 
let's say about six years ago, a farm was not yielding for her. So last year she decided to join the MDP program. And uh, after engaging with her, I diagnosed her farm. A farm and I recommended uh, I recommended for her for uh, I think you should replant half of a uh, farm and you, you know that replanting is very difficult decision seeing that she's a woman but to my surprise she told me that she would do it so last year she called our office and we went there to do the replant for her and well being so good this year the replant of the half of the farm is shooting very well and we are hoping that from next year going she will start at, at least seeing the good result from it and part of the farm that that was not replanted is due to good agricultural practices she's now getting a good year from there Oh, okay. That's 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 very very great. So, in all this engagement, what are some of the like, biggest challenges that you faced in your work? Okay, um, I have three challenges. Um, that is transportation, communication, and farmers' ability to adhere good agriculture practices. And uh, with regard for the transportation. I have to ride on a motorbike for two hours to get to my various society to work for the day. And I being a woman, sometimes <laughs> uh, it's not easy. Riding two hours to the various society, I just get dis dis distracted. And also, aside the two hours, I have to also walk one hour to the farms to work for the day so it's not be easy at all yeah then it means your work is really uh, challenging and, yeah. and and kudos to that yeah. so i want to also know how the COVID 19 i mean this current um, pandemic has affected all your work yeah yes uh all farmer training uh farmer engagement was seized so we have to work from home and due to lack of uh, bad communi uh, uh, communication network, some of the societies are not having a good network to at least call or to rate them to see what is going on there. So that one to uh, it just delay my work for about three months. Oh, okay. So, meaning uh, most farmers were cut off from your yes, support services. Yes. Okay, okay. So, in all this, what do you enjoy about your work? <laughs> Getting good results from my farmers. I, I feel appreciated and happy when uh, my farmer adhered I I hate the practice that I taught him. Okay, so um, from your since the farmer is able to adhere to the practices, from your own standpoint, how has this um, work as a community agent um, um, impacted or changed your life? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I would say that I've learned a lot from farmers and my working colleagues, um, especially when when they talk they, when they like when they share and let me let me put it in this way when they share um, an experience on experience in life and also about farming profession uh, this has taught me how to how to accommodate and also uh, varied and view opinion. Oh, okay. So, um, um, why do you think your work as a grooming agent is um, um, important? Why do you think it's really important? It's very important to me. Um, 
I got a chance to motivate, advice, and do coaching for uh, my farmers. At least it it help it help them uh, in a very special way. Let let me put it in this way. Um, Okay. So, um, in 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 all this, what in what way do you think um, collectively can be done to support um, the farmers that you work with? What are some of the things that you think we can do to help them or adapt some of the good agricultural practices that you propose to them? Okay. Um, one, how to apply fertilizer how to do good pruning. My major problem is the pruning. As for the pruning, it's very difficult for them to do it. So that's my, they do something about it, I will be happy about it. Oh, okay. So um, thank you, Benedicta, for all what you've been doing for um, this cohort of farmers that you work with, and also keenly supporting Grameen's agenda in, in, in helping and end poverty and also on our long-term mission as we stand now. So thank you all and I will hand over back to Emilia. Great, thank you so much, Benedicta and Francis. Thank you so much for sharing about the FDP Farmer Develop Farm Development Plan. It's clear, Benedicta, the information that you're providing helps farmers make crucial decisions to improve their livelihoods. It was a pleasure for all of us to get an inside look to your work. Next slide, please. From Ghana, let's move over to the Grameen Community Agent is known as Mitra, which means friend of the village. It's an apt description because Mitras do much more for their neighbors than just provide financial education and access. They become, they become go-to sources for information about government programs, nutrition, hygiene, and health tips, such as how to protect against COVID-19. Mitras, in fact, are so vital to their communities that the Indian government deemed their work essential during recent lockdowns. This meant with proper precautions that they could continue to provide services to their clients. And our Grameen project managers were able to support these Mitras remotely with health messaging, text messages, calls, and extra training. While many of the Mitra clients are female, Vandana has found a special niche uh, helping out male day laborers with financial access. Please be aware that this video is not highly produced, just a symptom of conducting interviews using a cell phone, but nonetheless, we really want you to hear her story in her own words and enjoy listening um, to her speak about her work. Let's play the video. Namaste, I'm Bhan Pratap Bhamne, Grameen Foundation of India, I'm as a project coordinator. Let's talk with Vandana Madam. This is Vandana Madam. You can tell me about it. Namaste, I'm from Grameen Foundation. ग्रामीण फाउंडेशन ऑफ इंडिया से ग्रामीण मित्र हूँ मेरा नाम वंदना टिकारे है मैं तालुका कलमेश्वर आदर्श नगर ग्रामीण में रहवासी हूँ मैं शादी शुदा हूँ मुझे दो बच्चे हैं और हम हस्बैंड वाइफ पूरे परिवार के साथ में जुड़ते रहते हैं मेरा पति सिविल काम पे जॉब करता है और मेरे बच्चों पढ़े करते हैं अच्छा आपको ग्रामीण मित्र बनने के पहले किन किन चुनौती का सामना करना पड़ा ग्रामीण मित्र बनने से पहले सर मुझे कुछ नॉलेज नहीं था क्योंकि ये मेरा पेशा नहीं था तो मुझे बहुत मतलब कठिनाई हुई लोग मेरे पे विश्वास नहीं करते गए मैं उनके तक गई तो वो अविश्वास करे कि ये लेडी कैसा ऐसा बैंकिंग का काम कर सकती है मुझे इग्नोर करते थे लेकिन मैं उनको विश्वास दिलाती गई की मैं ये काम करती हूँ मुझे अथॉरिटी दी गई है इस और ऐसे करते करते मैं अपना काम करती गई ग्रामीण मित्र बनने से पहले आपका क्या पेशा था आप क्या करती थी जी सर ग्रामीण मित्र बनने से पहले मैं कपड़े को जॉब करती थी मतलब कपड़े घूम घूम के बेचती थी उसके बाद मैंने पेट्रोल पंप पे एक साल तक जॉब किया अच्छा तो आपको ग्रामीण मित्र का क्या प्रशिक्षण दिया गया 
थे हमारे ग्राउंड फाउंडेशन के सर लोग आते थे वो मुझे प्रशिक्षण देते थे और उसी प्रशिक्षण से मैं सुनी उनका और अपने दिमाग में रखे पॉइंट को उसके कैसा बोलना है कैसा मतलब कैसे उनसे बात करना है और वही उसी के बेस पे मैं अपना काम करती गई और मुझे अपने हाथ के लिए एक मतलब पहचान अपनी बनाई मैंने अच्छा आपके काम का कोई एक विशिष्ट दिन आपने चुना है ऐसा जी सर आ, हमारे यहाँ बुधवार को मार्केट डे होता है और उस दिन क्या है रोज जो रोजगारी से लोग काम पे जाते हैं उस दिन उनका रेस्ट होता है मतलब आराम का दिन होता है उस दिन उनका मार्केट वार्केट रहता है तो उनका पेमेंट जो होता है वो वीकली होता है तो इस कारण से क्या होता है वो लोग मेरे पास आते हैं क्योंकि मैं बैंक मैं बैंक के काम करती हूँ तो उनको लगता है की विड्रॉल होकर हमको पैसा देंगी अगर वो बैंक जाएंगे तो उनका उनके पास इतना समय नहीं रहता की वो बैंक जाके विड्रॉल करके लाए और यहाँ से बैंक भी दूर है तो मैं उनकी उस दिन मदद करती हूँ इसी दिन के लिए इसी कारण से मैं इस दिन को सुनी हूँ अच्छा आप आपके बारे आपके काम के बारे में कैसा सोचती हैं मैं जो काम करती हूँ उससे लोगों की मतलब मदद हो और लोगों को सुविधाएं होती हैं और मुझे भी बहुत अच्छा लगता है मैं लोगों की मदद करती हूँ तो और, और मुझे प्राउड फील होता है आपके ग्राहक की कोई एक सफलता स्टोरी जिसके आपने मदद करी हो जी सर मेरे साथ ऐसा हुआ है कुछ दिन पहले एक बुजुर्ग बहुत बड़ा बुजुर्ग बहुत मतलब बुजुर्ग आदमी था और उसको वो पैरालाइज भी था वो चल नहीं सकता था और उसकी स्थिति मतलब वो बहुत गरीब थे और उन लोगों की स्थिति नहीं थी कि वो टू व्हीलर से या कोई फोर व्हीलर से उनको बैंक तक लेके जाए तो उनको मालूम हुआ कि अपने एरिया में ग्रामीण मित्र हैं तो उनके घर के लोग मेरे पास आए तो कि आप विड्रॉल करके दो तो मैंने बोला ठीक है हम आते हैं और मैं उनके यहाँ गई और वो बुजुर्ग आदमी का मैंने प्रिंट लेके विड्रॉल करके दिया और उनको पैसे दिए तो क्या वो ही पैसे उनके उनके इलाज पाने में लगाया और उनको बहुत खुशी हुई की हमको कभी जाना भी नहीं पड़ा और हमको विड्रॉल करके घर में मिला तो ये मेरे जीवन में ये घटना बहुत अच्छी घटी तो मुझे अच्छे से याद है इससे आपके काम से आपको कैसा महसूस होता है और आपके समुदाय के और आपके जिले को क्या मदद मिलती है आपके काम से मेरे समुदाय के लोगों को उनको जैसे कैसे बैंक बाहर बैंक दूर है और उनको और सुविधाएं होती है कि इतने दूर जाके लाइन में लगो और अपना पैसा विड्रॉल करो तो क्या है मैं उनके घर जाके या वो मेरे पास आके अपना काम करवाते हैं विजुअल करवाते हैं या बैलेंस चेक करवाते हैं जो भी काम है वो मतलब मैं उनका करवाती हूँ और मैं उनको सुविधा देती हूँ सेवाएं करती हूँ तो उनको सुविधा होती है अच्छा तो आपके समुदाय पूरा मजदूर वर्ग है हाँ मेरा समुदाय पूरा मजदूर वर्ग है इसी कारण से उनको मतलब उनको टाइम नहीं मिलता है मिलता है कि वो घर में रहे और अपना अगर एक दिन वो घर में रहेंगे तो उनका क्या है मतलब नुस्खा हो जाएगा उनका एक एक दिन का रोजी चली जाएगी इसी कारण से वो सोचते हैं कि अपना रोज भी ना गिरे और अपने पास जो ग्रामीण अपने घर अपने एरिया में जो ग्रामीण मित्र है उनसे अपन ये काम करवाए अच्छा अच्छा आपका और काफी आ, मुझे आ, काफी सपोर्ट मिलता है उनका आपका क्या लक्ष्य है आपका भविष्य आप लोग कैसा सोचते हैं हाँ जी सर मेरा यही लक्ष्य है कि मैं तो ज्यादा लिखे पढ़े नहीं हूँ और मेरा पति भी ज्यादा लिखा पढ़ा नहीं है तो मैं यही चाहती हूँ कि मुझे दो बच्चे मेरे दो बच्चे पढ़ लिख के अच्छे आदमी बने अच्छे लेवल पे जाए और वो अपना नाम रोशन करे और मतलब की वो अच्छे एक स्तर पे जाए एक तो मेरा ये लगता है दूसरा मेरा लगती ये है कि मैं आबादी पे कच्चा मकान बना के रहती हूँ तो कि मेरा एक खुद का एक घर हो बस मुझे मेरा दो एक लक्ष्य है आपको क्या लगता है कि ग्रामीण मित्र का एक क्या महत्वपूर्ण काम है जिससे आप लोग महत्व जाने आपके ग्राम मित्र देखो सर मैं मुझे वो मतलब मेरे मन में कहीं ना कहीं एक इच्छा थी कि मैं अच्छा काम करूं एक ऑफिसियल करूं लेकिन मेरे पास ना कोई डिग्री थी ना कुछ था तो मैं ऐसे लेवल पे काम कर सकूं लेकिन जब मुझे ऐसा ऑफर आया कि मुझे ग्रामीण मित्र बनना पड़ा तो मैं मैं यही चाहती थी कि मेरी एक इमेज बने लोगों के नजर में मेरा नाम हो मैं अपनी पहचान बना सकती हूँ की लोग मुझे बोले की ये बहुत अच्छा काम करते बहुत अच्छे ग्रामीण मित्र है तो इसी कारण से लोगों को लोगों को मैंने यकीन दिलाया 
विश्वास दिलाया उनके बीच में जाके उनको मतलब मैंने आज एक मैं सबसे ग्रामीण मित्र हूँ और लोग मुझे एक एक अच्छा सफलता सब, पूर्वक ग्रामीण मित्र मानते हैं Wonderful. Thank you so much. Vandana reminds us once again that people all over the world dream of the same things. Education for their children and perhaps a better home to raise them in. The Kunta house that Vandana spoke of is usually made of mud and straw. The Paka house she dreams would be more permanent structure built out of stone. We so often hear from our community agents who most of them are also very poor themselves that their work as on micro entrepreneurs allows them to hope and achieve their dreams. Next slide, please. Before we go into our next segment, we'd like to answer uh, two questions about our community agents and the videos that we've presented. As a reminder, you may submit your questions using the Q&A function on the Zoom function. Uh, we're a little bit behind, so Steve and I will do our best to answer some questions and anything, any questions we don't get to, we can send out those answers in a follow-up email. Amelia, I think, uh, I think her statement, Bandana's statement about creating her own identity had such meaning for me, right? It is about mm -hmm. her being empowered, her having, you know, a way that she helps you know, her own community, her family come up and be respected. It, it just, that, that just hit me. Yeah, absolutely. And the gender dynamics that change in that case where she's been able to find a way to gain the trust of men and provide a crucial service. Steve, here's absolutely. a question for you. How do you mean identify and choose agents? Right. Well, we're, we're very fortunate with our history, of course, in so many countries you know, of having been so instrumental in helping to develop the microfinance movement, uh, supporting microfinance organizations, developing women's groups in so many countries. Uh, and it's really that, that experience and that connection that has helped us identify the right, you know, the right people to take on, the right women in particular to take on these roles. You know, they, they have to be trusted, they have to be respected, they have to be pe people of, of very, very high integrity because they are advising people or helping people with financial issues. So, you know, that, that uh, women coming up from microfinance and having that community respect is the, is the, is the first element, really, that, that has made, that made it a success. Great, that's great. Thanks so much, Steve. We've gotten another question. How are agents paid hourly on commission and how is that decided? Do you want to answer that one, Amelia? You're probably better, <laughs> better than I am at answering that. I can take a stab if you, if you want to defer. Sure, absolutely. Well, we've got a couple, a couple of models. Um, there's, there's agents that work directly with us as Grameen. There are agents that work through our, through our partners um, and mostly on a, on a commission basis based on the number of, of transactions, the types of transactions. Um, as you see, agents go into the, out into the communities and others are also providing services from their Sari Star, your kind of small shops and stores um, where can, they can kind of combine different activities. I mean, I, I just add, you know, we, we know our work in India that if a woman is able to devote up to two hours a day, she can earn about $20 a month. You know, of course, that goes up. If she's able to devote five hours a day, she's earning $100 a month. And I'll remind everybody that, you know, really a, a, a dollar ninety a day is the level of critical poverty. So that's a significant improvement. You know, uh, we have, we have mate, uh, Mitras who are very active, like Bandana, who really is, is earning in excess of $300 a month. Uh, in the Philippines, it's roughly that level. Um, so it... It's a, you know, they are entrepreneurs in their own, in their own right. They, they do the time and the effort that they're able to commit to it, but it adds significant resources uh, to their families. Great. Perfect. Thanks so much, Steve. So let's move on to our next section and our next slide um, to let you know about another exciting um, program, our COVID emergency cash pilot. 
As Steve had mentioned in the beginning in his remarks, um, this isn't traditionally a, a type of, um, we're not traditionally giving humanitarian aid, but Crimean was able to step up to the plate and quickly pivot using our technology and tools to get emergency cash into people's hands. As we all know, uh, COVID-19 has um, affected all of us around the world due to the lockdowns and crashing economies. Families in poor communities, many as we have heard our day laborers, didn't have any savings and immediately found themselves facing the likelihood of hunger, lack of health care, and loss of housing. With the support of our donors and partners, we quickly launched the, the COVID-19 emergency cash pilot in the Philippines, India, and refugee settlements in Uganda. This is based on evidence that emergency cash has a profound impact on sustaining people living in poverty, especially in extreme economic stress like we are facing now. By providing these unconditional cash transfers, we're able to give people dignity where dignity to use it as they need and as they see fit best. Cash for, cash for healthcare, food, housing. What's important is that we're empowering people to decide for themselves. Next slide, please. So here we'll take a look at uh, what happened in the Philippines. There was a series of strict lockdowns that were implemented in a number of cities around the Philippines. Transportation, stores, offices were completely closed and many people lost their sources of income. For women, this was especially a heavy burden because they're also the primary care caregivers. And women micro entrepreneurs were deeply challenged to sustain their incomes during these lock lockdowns. By leveraging our existing relationships with local microfinance institutions, we were able to quickly identify emergency cash beneficiaries, focusing particularly on female entrepreneurs. In all, to each family, we delivered 100 US dollars, along with health and financial tips through SMS messages, which reached 180 families in six cities, which impacted a total of 1,260 beneficiaries. As we can see in, this, in, the, in the slide here, they were primarily used to fund food, support their business, as well as medicine. Next slide, please. Our true impact, we can hear directly from our beneficiaries. So from a quote from Estrella Arvisa, who said, I'm very happy for being selected. I bought food, especially rice, and then used a portion of the cash transfer to stock up my e-load business. The difference, the big difference that the cash transfer made was that I was, was able to use it for my business and not only relief goods. Let's also hear from Mary Grace Nodella. There's so much that $100 did for me, but more than supplies I bought it, I, that I bought to feed my family, the thought that someone was looking after us, those of us having difficulty in these times, is something I'm grateful for. I still consider myself lucky and we eat and earn a few. And I know it'll only get better from here. Next slide, please. Let's jump over to India. On March 14th, Prime Minister Modi of India shut down the economy with four hours notice. All Indians were ordered to stay indoors. Factories and offices went dark, markets and state borders were closed and transportation completely ceased. Tens of millions of Indians lost their jobs instantly. Migrant workers who had traveled to major cities to find a better life lost their construction jobs immediately and were forced to return to their villages to survive. With no way to transport food, farmers watched their crops rot in their fields as many of their countrymen and women went hungry. While the lockdowns have since eased, there still continues to be a fear of catching the virus and many people are turned away from hospitals and the virus continues to cripple the economy. An ILL report in India estimates that 400 million people in India will likely fall back into poverty due to this crisis. In India and other developing countries, women are particularly hit hard. 70% of women are employed in the informal economy and have few protections. In response, Grameen mobilized to, mobilized to deliver emergency cash as well to these families. 
As we can see here, we identified 165 poor families from the informal labor sector in the Nevada district in India, where we delivered $60 to each family to use for sustenance and to restart their businesses. In total, we impacted 656 beneficiaries. We designed specifically for this program our Grameen Forgiving app and Grameen Vulnerability Index that allowed us to identify beneficiaries and deliver funds quickly. We are very pleased that we received recognition from the local administration from Nevada as one of uh, as Grameen Foundation India as one of the first responders to the crisis in Nevada. And to give you an idea how quickly this was done, they congratulated us on our fastest delivery system since our identification and disbursement, the entire process took only seven days compared to theirs, which took months. Next slide. The gentleman you see here on the left is Ramashish, a 50 year old man from Nevada. He's completely paralyzed and he lives with his wife and they're dependent on their son for sustenance. Their son works in New Delhi as a daily wager and hasn't been able to sh send money back. A quote from Adnan Diopriya, our, senior pro our program senior manager, describes what inspires all of us at Grameen as well as our donors. I could see his eyes getting moist when we were handing him the support money. These are the moments in our lives that encourage us to keep helping others who may not be as blessed as us. Finding a way to help people like Ramashish is what gets us out of bed in the morning. Next slide, please. Here we hear from Raja, who is another daily laborer that we were able to help in India. She says, we are daily wage laborers. Because of the virus, we are unable to earn money. We are very grateful for the, for the help offered. Next slide, please. And finally, we moved to Uganda, the third place where we piloted our COVID-19 cash response. We focused on the relief in the refugees, the relief for refugees in the Bidi Bidi and Palurinha refugee settlements. Impacts of COVID-19 are particularly severe in refugee populations where the pandemic has halted economic activities, blocked 90% of aid and 30% of food assistance and unfortunately has also caused an increase in domestic violence and crime. Using an entirely digital model, we identified and delivered $38 to each family, which is enough to support one family for one month to 679 highly vulnerable participants, which impacted a total of 3,055 total beneficiaries. As you can see, the majority was used to fund food, followed by medicine, uh, for their business, as well as a little bit of savings. Next slide, please. I'm sorry you can't see him better, but the man on the far right is Stefan Lejong, who lives with his family in the Bidi Bidi refugee settlement in Uganda. He used his emergency cash funds to meet his family's most urgent needs and then to start a business to become more resilient. He says, before receiving the money, life was not going well for my family. There was sickness and a poor food diet. As soon as I withdraw the funds, I got treatment for my family. I also bought, bought some food and started a liquid soap business. The most important thing I'd like to share with you is to congratulate you on your work and to acknowledge Grameen in trying to help people like me. Next slide. In this photo, you see Sarah Muya in the spotted white top and her family who all live in the Bitty Bitty, Refu Bitty Bitty Refugee Settlement. Sarah is 34 years old and runs a fish business. Travel restrictions made it difficult for her to restock her business. And as a single mother, she was forced to use some of her business capital to feed her family. The family had irregular meals during the lockdown because the World, the World Food Program has been rationing food. The funds Sarah received as a beneficiary of Grameen's cash transfer program helped her feed her family and stock her business. We really hope that you enjoyed seeing some of the results of our emergency cash pilots. As you can see, the projects have had impact, immediate impacts. And though our work has just begun, we are confident that the technologies and frameworks 
we've built and tested here will continue to help vulnerable populations facing profound threats to their lives and livelihoods. I do want to mention that in addition to the emergency cash project, Vermeen is currently working on additional pandemic related projects. In the Philippines, we were able to provide nachos and e vouch for growth and medicine, 3,472 beneficiaries, most of them who are female migrant entrepreneurs. And we're working in Rwanda and Sierra Leone to leverage technologies that we use to fight the Ebola outbreak and at nearly 60,000 community health workers to educate local populations on COVID-19. Next slide, please. Well, we're almost wrapping up with our webinar and Steve and I wanted to give you another chance to answer any questions you may have about the COVID-19 work that we had mentioned before we wrap up. One of the things I'm very proud of uh, it, from the feedback in India is not only how much it's being relied on, but also, you know, the, there's been a major government effort now to help scale up direct cash transfers. And many of, many of our mitras are involved in that, are supporting that, you know, are able to be a, a you know, a link to that for their community. So that, that's really the kind of, um, of you know, of, of support that we were really hoping to have by, a, not by bringing this pilot uh, on in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how we were able to leverage technology so quickly and really use what's our expertise to get um, those funds directly um, in the hands of women has been really inspirational to see yep. so close up. We, we do have two questions, Amelia. Uh, maybe I can read them. Um, Great. Uh, really appreciation for our work. Can you speak uh, about how much of any donation goes to programs and the people who are delivering these services versus administrative overhead and fundraising? Uh, I can I can certainly do that. Yep. Great. Um, you know, we, we, we're, uh, we're a very staff intensive organization. Our, our work is not about delivering goods and services. You know, it's not about, uh, you know, uh, delivering, you know, a food or anything like that. So we're, we're very dependent on the expertise of our staff. So our, 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 our overhead levels are right around about 15 to 18%. And our staff, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of our, you know, of our, of our overall budget is pretty significant, largely because, you know, it really does rely on the expertise of folks like, like Amelia and the folks that you saw in the field to, to help and support you know, other people in the field. I've worked in other organizations that depended more on material transfer in their programs, but ours is about expertise in people. And then we have another question from Alex Counts, who is uh, my predecessor here <laughs> at Grameen Foundation. So it's great to have you on, Alex. Uh, and I think this is a question for you, Amelia. Yep, can, you say more about the can you say more about the vulnerability index and how it works and, and how, how does it help? Thanks for the Great, question, thanks, Alex. Alex. Great to have you with us. Absolutely. So um, as part of the Grameen Forgiving app, we wanted to combine a, a number of, of available tools uh, to be able to create this vulnerability index and ensure that we really were reaching uh, the most poor. And so we combined the um, PPI, uh, which was also cross-checked in India. We have um, the government lists of folks who are um, on the different poverty levels and poverty scales. We added that as well with additional information from the community uh, about specific life circumstances, the type of home people were living in, um, and some questions that, that Adnan, who you saw, was able to ask uh, to be able to really um, understand if they had faced any additional shocks, combine all those pieces to really, really understand the, the poorest and the most vulnerable um, in, in the Nevada uh, region. Great. I think we're ready to wrap up. Is that right, Amelia? Yes, we are. Let's go to the okay. next slide. And um, Steve and I want to thank you for your attendance, for your support. Thanks for the great participation. Um, as someone who works in the field and, and is based in the field, it's really a pleasure to have this opportunity to share our work with you. And thank you for all of your support. We'll be emailing a link to today's recording in case you missed any of it or want to share it with your family and friends. Um, Steve, I'll hand it over to you for your final remarks. Amelia, thanks so much. Uh, you know, I want to thank you for doing such an excellent job. I want to thank all the folks 
Edgar Mead Foundation who've been in the background and you know pulled together uh, this this webinar. Really great. Thank you all uh, on the line for joining us and sharing your time. Uh, we we certainly hope that you're inspired by the work that we do. We're all very very fortunate at Grameen Foundation to to be a part of this work, and we're very fortunate to have your your support. Um, you know, I, I just want to emphasize once again. You know, I've been in this work a long time, and we have never had such an urgent set of circumstances impacting the global poverty. And I sincerely believe, and I hope you see it from our field testimonies, that the work we do is critical at this moment, right, in continuing to help support the poorest in the world deal with this, these life changing, these life threatening events that are, that are there. So your support is more urgent than ever. Uh, you know, please, uh, we're asking you if you can, please continue to support this work and if, if possible, to elevate your support in any way that it's possible. Uh, you know, we're, we're not a hard a sell, hard press, not for profit in our fundraising, but actually now is a critical time uh, and we, we do need your support now. If you're able to become a monthly supporter, that would be fantastic. If you can ask your employer uh, to consider uh, matching gifts, that would be deeply appreciated. But how, however you choose to support this work, uh, we sincerely hope that you consider making a donation to, to allow us to continue to expand the work that you've heard about. There's, there's never been a time in my life when it's been as important as now. So thank you very much for all of your attention and uh, thank you all my colleagues for all the great work that, uh, that's going on. So much appreciated and have a good day.